too little short for a stormtrooper. <laughs> What's up, nerds? Welcome to another episode of the Multiverse Report. We are recapping. No, wait, we're not recapping anything. We're just talking to a guy. Yeah, this is a episode of TMR Talks. That's right. Welcome to TMR Talks. This time featuring Jay Stevens himself, cartoonist and comic book writer, creator of the comic book series Dwellings, which you may remember I uh, named as my number one comic book of the year in our 2023 wrap-up episode. Um, he's also uh, the creator of the uh, animated show Tuttenstein, Secret Saturdays, and also the Jet Cat animated shorts on Cartoon Network. Um, he has a Kickstarter that's about to launch for a brand new kid-friendly, family-friendly comic called Figgy Furthermore, the Spirit Guide Dog. Uh, that's launching on February 12th, uh, Kickstarter for that through Golden Key Comics. And you can sign up to be notified about that. Steve, I thought this was a great conversation. Yeah, I think uh, it was it was awesome to have Jay on the pod and uh, glad he could stop by. And, you know, we got some real insight into uh, his background, what went into dwelling, some of his uh, influences, um, it, so, <laughs> some tidbits that uh, that really, really shined up, especially if you've seen or read the uh, if you've seen the issues. Just if you looked at them, you don't have to actually read them. <laughs> no, uh, uh, it's, it was it was a really really fun interview. I feel like we could have talked to him longer. Oh, one hundred percent. If you and I didn't have like a time constraint right. on our personal <laughs> lives, we had to get somewhere. <laughs> um, but like we, he was like ready to hang. I feel like we could have talked to him a lot longer, and hopefully we'll have him back someday. Um, yeah, especially when super uh, nice guy when that Kickstarter goes live or something, we should have him back on to talk about that a little more. Um, yeah, for sure. Or if one of the other projects that he teased very true. in the interview happens, maybe he'll want to come back on and talk about those. So um, you can check him yeah. out too uh, on his socials um, at J Stevens Comics. Uh, Stevens spelled the right way: S T E P H E N. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely give Jay a look. And um, yeah, and he's on Instagram. He's on Threads. I know. Um, I think he's on Twitter, but I don't know. I'm, I haven't been on Twitter in a yep, while. he's yet, got a YouTube that... channel uh, as yep. well. Yeah, it's a it's a great YouTube channel. He's got a lot of uh, uh, cool videos on there as well. So you can check him out anywhere. Um, uh, copies of Dwellings are still on the stands. Uh, he mentioned though, that the though third... not at our local uh, Funky Town Comics and Toys. I believe well, they are cause... sold out because they're sold out and he just he said in the, he says in this interview that the uh third issue of dwellings yep. um has just recently sold out so it's going back to print so there will be more um at your local comic book stores uh relatively soon and um you know like we already said he's got a lot of stuff that's on the way out so um give him a follow um check him out if you like uh what he has to say or i mean we've been raving about dwellings for weeks since and months it came now, out so yeah yeah, so um, yeah, I think Jesse Jesse gave it to us or suggested it to us on a whim, and we were like, "Oh, okay, this was good." Yeah, well, I think you had it before me. You yeah, had he it told me he like, was like, "This wa- this is kind of like hyped this. or something," and I was like, yeah. "Oh, this is a mic book. This is definitely a yeah." Mic book. I I read three pages of it, and I was like, "Oh, this is the greatest thing ever." <laughs> <laughs> if you're a horror fan, yeah, uh, we do talk a lot about horror influences and um, movies and where all these ideas kind of came yeah, from. And this is not one to watch with your kids. So, put them to bed. Oh, uh, yeah. Do people watch this with their kids? I don't, I don't know. know. That's the thing. I figure it's I better to it. say that than the alternative. So, yeah, yeah, you're right. True, true, true. Um, but anyway, yeah, we really loved having him on. We were super grateful that he uh, was uh, so generous with his time um, and talking to us. And uh, um, yeah, Jay Stevens, I hope you uh, enjoy the interview as much as we enjoyed it. Um, and I think that's it. I think that's it. We'll be back with a. Uh, weekly episode sometime soon yeah we just realized we can't do sunday so keep an eye on your feeds people Who yeah knows? we'll figure it out we'll figure it out and let you know um but that's it so uh thanks for watching and thanks for listening to the following interview with jay stevens all right jay stevens welcome to the multiverse report thanks for having me guys this is awesome it is awesome. We are very excited to talk to you. Uh, we were just talking uh, before we started rolling um, 
a little bit just about how your most recent book, Dwellings, was my favorite book of the last year. Um, I think when I was talking about this interview or posting it on our Instagram, I, sp I said my favorite horror book of the last year, but I need to rectify that by saying favorite overall comic that I read of 2023. Wow, thank you and, so much. And that's not the first time we mentioned it on this show. We talked about it quite a bit. Um, so it really just kind of knocked our socks off when we got it. So we're really thankful for you uh, being here and excited to talk to you. You get me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, you're uh, coming all the way from Ontario, Canada, out of uh, Guelph, is that what it's called? It's Guelph. You pronounced it correctly. Yes. Oh, it's nice. the, okay. the, the spelling looks like you might have to sound like a cat with a hairball to pronounce it. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's just it's south of Toronto. It's a it's a beautiful town. I've been here now for a couple of decades. Nice. It's a great place to make comics. Oh, nice. we, we cheated because oh, cool. we're Syracuse based anyway. So, oh, yeah, we're like, we're like <laughs> yeah, Canada South, so it's fine. We're currently yeah, experiencing the same weather system. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that is true. Yeah, cold and snowy. Mm -hmm. um, it was actually a little bit welcome to for some cold and snowy uh, after like a very incredibly green holiday season. <laughs> I don't know yeah. about you, but down here it was. Yeah, a little. Yeah, soggy yeah. and gray, very dwellings esque. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah for sure. <laughs> um, so uh, you said you've been in Guelph for a few decades. Um, a, a couple, anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you were born in, you're from Canada originally, correct? Yes, yes. Born in Toronto, um, oh, cool. Toronto, Ontario. And then uh, spent my teen years in Brampton, for those that oh. know, they know. Um, and then settled here um, straight out of art school. So, and, oh, wow. and actually came here to make comics, literally. So I met, yeah. met a couple of friends in art school, Nick Crane specifically, um very talented cartoonist and illustrator and musician um in the ontario college of art in toronto and we met there and a guy a couple of grade a couple of years older than us working on the student newspaper did did comics for the uh the art school paper and was asking um different students of different disciplines if they wanted to contribute we did the response was great Nick knew a guy that owned a comic store back here in Guelph that wanted to publish us for real. And the rest is history. Came here oh, and wow. co-founded Tragedy Strikes Press in 1990, 91. Oh, wow. Nice. Yeah. So I've been doing this a long time. Yeah, for sure. I was going to ask, you said that Guelph, you said specifically, is a great place to make comics. I was going to ask you why you mm -hmm. feel that way. Um, but well, I answer that, I guess. the first thing was it used to be uh, a lot cheaper to live here. I'm not sure that's true anymore. Um, but the downtown, downtown Guelph is is gorgeous. I mean, again, speaking of dwellings, which certainly is inspired by this kind of geography. Yeah, it's yeah. an older downtown with a couple of rivers and bridges, old buildings, yeah. pretty chill, very walkable community, you know, rep cinema, book, used bookstore, um, just good vibes. And uh, back in the day, and a student town, there's a university here. And back in the day, there were plenty of kind of lofty, artsy apartments for rent. Oh, so nice. just, a, just a good place to hunker down and be able to walk around to get everything you need and just focus on, uh, on art. Yeah, like nice. low pressure, slower pace kind of town. Yeah. Like. And oh. uh, I'm not sure how, where you are of uh, Seth's work, cartoonist Seth, Palookaville. Um, uh, a vague familiarity but not yeah so he, he he also relocated here so he lives here as oh, okay. well so oh wow yeah you got a whole community going that's awesome <laughs> um so when prior to art school um i mean how you're a cartoonist you're a comic book writer creator when does like obviously like uh, I, I guess probably the majority of kids get into cartoons early on, but like when, when did you start getting into comics or like the creation of those things and what kind of sucked you in uh, to that world and kept you there? It's a great question. And it's, it's a little layered. I'll try to be brief, but first of all, um, I was always drawing as a kid and had a family that did not discourage that. So oh, nice. thanks to them. So I was, I was always drawing. Um, and then, yeah, definitely big fan of Saturday morning cartoons and animation and, and, uh, and that stuff. Um, I think I saw, um, I, I started to get really interested in obscure stuff young 
for some reason I was, I, you know, there was the stuff on the shelves. There was the stuff you saw, you know, I was a big fan of newspaper comic strips too, you know, big peanuts fan. Sure. Um, and Calvin and Hobbes, you know, all that stuff was, was inspiring still is. Yeah. So that stuff was freely available. The cartoons you would see on TV were freely available and the comics, the comic books, um, basically on the rack back in those days, yeah. uh, in Brampton were freely available. We didn't have a comic store yet. Um, but I think I saw two things happen to me that made me start to think backwards. And this is what really turned me into a collector and a hunter. Mm -hmm. Um, was I think it must have been an episode of the wonderful world of Walt Disney or something. And he did an episode on the animation that inspired Disney. And so it was uh, Windsor McKay's Gertie the Dinosaur and Fleischer Brothers stuff. Oh, sure. And I'd never seen that. I was a kid and I went, wait, there's, there's other stuff? How do I get this? And around the same time, um, my grandparents who particularly, um, they were British um, expats that had immigrated post-war and they were natural hoarders <laughs> and c collectors. My grandfather collected coins. So when I started buying comic books with the money they gave me instead of chips or chocolate bars, um, they encouraged that as well to be a collector and help me keep oh, them wow. in a special place and keep them in good condition. Um, just instinctively before there was any kind of collector's market that any of us knew about. Sure. Right. Yeah. And uh, so they knew I loved comics and they would pick batches up like piles of them at yard sales and, and flea markets huh. they would go to. And on one of these, they grabbed an old overstreet price guide from like 1974 or something hmm. thinking I might like it. Thinking, maybe thinking, you know, I think my grandfather was like, see, they're worth something. Yeah. But going through that book and seeing hundreds of titles I'd never heard of. I mean, think about how inaccessible comics history was at that time, pre-internet. Yeah, sure, yeah. Um, so seeing all these titles I'd never heard of. And they had these little black and white covers across the top of every page of all these ancient uh, mostly superhero conflicts I'd never heard of. So those two things, those mysteries about the past um, is kind of what kept me driven for years. I spent uh, I spent decades trying to track down the background for all this stuff I'd, I'd, I'd had these small tastes of. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, and that's kind of, that's kind of how, I feel like that's probably kind of how a lot of people dive into comics. They read one book that they love and they read it for a while and then all of a sudden a different character shows up and you're like, well, wait, who's that? Right. Where do the, where do I find them or whatever? You know, it's exactly. like, oh, they have a whole other history. Like, oh, right. I can There's dive into that too. Like, that I can go and go forever. Yeah, it's like uh, you know, it's like a YouTube rabbit yeah. hole, but you know, back in the day, definitely in, in print. Well, yeah. that was, I mean, for me, it was Barnes and Noble or whatever the equivalent. It was Walden Books or whatever back then. Oh, sure, yeah, yeah. And uh, I went in looking for uh, Star Wars expanded universe books back in the early '90s, like was the <laughs> Thrawn trilogy. And then turned around and there was a rack of books and your your comics and you're just like, I wonder what these are. Oh, right. Okay. <laughs> yep. yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> like I remember watching the the sixties Batman show when I was a kid. Um might have been my first introduction to Batman in general, or like old Super Friends uh yep. cartoons and stuff. And then I think I was like sick one time, my dad brought me like a Batman comic, and I was like, Oh. I can read these. And then I was like, Oh, they're in the grocery store or whatever. Like, Oh, then that's yeah. all I'm going to do forever. And it's the same, um, in, um, you know, Steve, you, Steve grew up a little bit more remote from the general Syracuse that's area. Nice but, uh, I was right in the middle of the Adirondacks. So. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, but even in, in where I was growing up, like there, the first time there was an actual comic book store, I bl it blew my mind. I was like, well, I, a what a whole store <laughs> a whole store just for these things that i love like i would we would drive past one going somewhere else and i would just yell at my mom i'm like mom we have to go back like i would saw like any yeah. store that had like a superman thing in the windows like we have to go there we have to go there oh, yeah. you know and it wasn't even about buying stuff we're just looking at like all the, all this stuff exists like you're saying like what is all this stuff how just can i overwhelmed right the yeah. first time you see uh multitudes of back issues you're just like i, I I don't know where to start. Right. Yes. Thumb through. Yeah. I can't imagine the th the first time like thumbing through a long box of like what there's what it's not stopping. There's no there's more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so did you have um did you have uh like a favorite uh 
a book or character that you did gravitate towards? Definitely. Yeah. So um, in comic books specifically, I think the the very first, like I said, I had, you know, my grandparents would take me and the other grandkids to the the corner store and so you could have one thing. Right. And I remember the first time I picked a comic book, my grandmother said, that's a really smart choice. Oh, nice. After they're all done with their treats, you're still going to have that. <laughs> mm, nice. And uh, I think it was um, Marvel 2-in-1. I can't remember the particular issue, but it's with the Scarecrow. Do you remember Marvel Scarecrow? They've changed his yeah, name now. He's kind of, uh, they have a oh backstory. God. He came out of the painting. Yeah. Uh, anyway. I have no idea That's about this character. Very odd book. It was yes. it was kind of peak Marvel horror. Sure. They were doing some weird stuff, but I, I love the thing. Ben Grimm, I mean, he's made of orange rock. What yeah. what uh, what seven or eight year old isn't going to think that's just oh, the yeah. coolest thing? Yeah. <laughs> um, so that was probably the first. And then I was I was actually an Iron Man fan. I know that's a that was for many many years. That was a really strange thing to say. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I was a big Iron Man fan. Had a big collection. I still have some Iron Man art, old art on my wall. Oh wow, yeah. Um, awesome. And uh, so those were kind of my first superhero loves. And then through the thing, got into the Fantastic Four. So I'm a I'm an FF Iron Man guy, sure. I guess um and then and then the harvey spooky stuff so casper hot stuff wendy um yeah. spooky the tough little ghost yeah that mm -hmm. was also my jam i was into that too That's uh awesome. way longer than most kids were that was uh, yeah mike and i were talking the other day and he was like doing some research for the interview as you do and he was like is I, I couldn't put my finger on where the art style came from. And then as soon as he said Casper, it was like, oh. I would I kept describing the Dwellings art style as like it'd be like something like that you see in like Dexter's laboratory or like Cartoon Network in like the nineties or something. And then I I think I, I saw like a different interview or you or you were talking about it and you said Casper Harvey comic stuff. And I was like, of course. It's ex it's like it's yeah. so reminiscent of that. It's I mean, it's not it's not uh, it's definitely um that's the heart of it. I yeah. mean, it's not yeah. a slavish copy. There is actually, it's interesting you mentioned Dexter's Lab because I, I was raised on Hanna-Barbera cartoons as well. So there's sure. there's definitely a Hanna-Barbera vibe in there as oh, well. Absolutely. Um, yeah, absolutely. It's kind of like a cross a, a, a crossbreed of those those uh, early influences. Yeah, I think yeah, the big and... thing was like that, just the, I don't want to say bulbous, but like the bulbous art on the heads and all that, that as soon as the Harvey <laughs> thing came in, it was like, Got it. Okay. There's the influence. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I just remember looking at Casper and I mean, I still appreciate the design. I, I mean, I have a like, I have like a little <laughs> right. Casper toy yeah, right behind see. me still. Like I, um, um, I can't believe how wonderful that design is. So simple. Yeah. White. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's no bells and whistles and yep. he's just got that encephalitic cuteness that, uh, Kawaii thing like way before you know Sanrio uh was able to capitalize on it and <laughs> he's just so cute I remember as a kid yeah. just I, I just kept staring at it going why is it so cute <laughs> even it's though ghost, he's clearly a cute. dead kid right yeah <laughs> uh yeah which is the secret which is also I think um part of the reason that uh Dwellings knocked me out so much when I read it for the first time. And then again, doing the a bit of research that I was doing for the interview, like Steve mentioned, I can't, it, like the more that I either saw you talk or read um, you talk about dwellings, it seemed, or you're in like things that you were into, it seemed like dwellings for you was just like looking at a shelf of things that you love and being like, I'm going to take this and I'm going to take this and a little bit of Hanna-Barbera, a little bit of Casper, a little bit of this kind of horror, a little bit of ghost story, a little bit of... A little video, bit of like... uh, 70s demonology. Yeah, film, yeah. Autography. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. Um, yeah, Matthew, seriously, that's that's literally what happened. I mean, it was... Uh, I hadn't really done um, any serious ongoing comic work in quite some time. And then it was early pandemic, you know, it's just like, yeah. well, I'm not doing anything. Right. And my old friend, Michelle Vrana, who was the guy in art school that <laughs> published that my first comic work in art school. And the guy oh, wow. that came to Guelph with me to start Tragedy Strikes way back when okay. he went on to become a, a award winning book designer. And he was just like, have you seen the um, 
the opportunities in publishing that we never had, like with print on demand and and yeah. um, crowdfunded, you know, um, pre-orders. He's like, we could, you could do full color, you could do anything. Um, and I really hadn't. I was like, I don't know. Yeah, I guess that's how people do it now. And he goes, no, take a look at this. Do you have any ideas? Hmm. And so that first issue of Dwellings was an experiment. It was kind of a one-off story. Eh? Part of the reason why they're all standalone stories. Sure. Because the first one needed to have a beginning, middle, and an end. Yeah. And yeah, the Oni Press ones are are, are, are double features. Right. Um, right. The Oni. But um, so we did the one. And it literally was a mix of my of my childhood um, fascinations and traumas. You know, I I was exposed to horror films very early. <laughs> uh, my family have always been big fans. I'm a huge fan now, but I remember seeing too much weird stuff. I mean, I think I described in in maybe one of the print interviews that you read that idea of like I'm reading hot stuff, the little devil, and in the other room I hear these weird noises. And my family's watching The Exorcist on TV. Oh man! And that that double tap of demonology, I was just like, I don't get it. Like, then is yeah. what I'm reading evil, or is what's right. on the TV not evil? Like, I'm so confused. It's <laughs> really. Funny. And so I tried to pour that kind of energy into into dwellings as a completely self indulgent um, experiment, and lo and behold, people liked it. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that a lot of times, um, in a in a weird way, the more the more specific you can make something, the more relatable it is in a lot of ways. Um, like so, like you know, you're like you're not the only one that has these similar feelings or traumas or whatever. So, uh, tapping into that a lot of can really help you affect other people as they're reading it. I certainly felt that way in the the issue three or the third issue of the Oni Press book, but uh the sixth issue uh sixth single issue oh yeah so the final the final story yeah, yeah. just yeah. like kids Under being growth. assholes in the woods and stuff like just doing stuff that they shouldn't be doing like i remember that right. i remember those kids yeah. i remember trying to you know like first thinking it's exciting and then being like well i don't know if i should be here like that kind of yeah. stuff i was like really kind of plugged into that one a lot it's and it's, it's and it's, it's horrifying to remember those things, isn't it? Yes, to remember yeah. how amoral we were as children. Yeah. Where you're like, yeah, I did terrible things. Yeah. Yes. And I'm just glad I didn't go too far. Right. Yes. Yeah. It's like a uh it's like a, a scary is there is, is there a scary version of nostalgia? <laughs> or like is there a word for yes. that? Like I don't know. It's yeah trauma, I guess. Trauma is <laughs> probably what that word is. Well, I I love I love the word nostalgia too. And I mean, this is dwellings is uh works on a couple of levels um because it kind of looks like an old comic and is kind of about old comics yeah. um nostalgia is built into the project and that idea i mean you know that the the root of that word the the like um latin like nostos algos i think it i think it basically translates to his return home in pain yeah oh, right and oh, i, I mean as as collectors um, or people interested in in pop culture who keep hunting for this thing we're never going to get, I mean, isn't that kind of a horror story too? Yeah, wow. you know, so I'm not so sure there is a good version of nostalgia. To be honest, uh, I think I agree with you. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, um, but I'm guilty. I'm guilty. <laughs> sure, yeah. I'm a very nostalgic person. Um, was the idea always to blend the cute drawing or the cute art style with the horrific storytelling because i think that feel that really like makes it stand out for me that's what really what made it uh, really sing for me i think was that always the intention absolutely yeah and i mean again it was a one-off experiment but yeah um once the feedback started coming in i'm like okay if i was going to do it again would i do it differently and kind of stuck with it um yeah. Yeah, no, and and again, I'm I'm nowhere near the first person to do this, and a lot of um, my favorite manga is is adorable looking, sure, and yeah. quite quite brutally horrific. Yeah. Um, so there are other um, comics traditions that that certainly have this more uh, established as a kind of subgenre, um, you know, and but yeah, I, it didn't it didn't look like too many people were doing it 
um no i mean in the north american market and i was like yeah for sure let's let's see if this is too weird yeah no i think it was it's perfect because it's like the first um it's like the first couple of pages it, it's not until that the the character i don't remember the character's name but the the guy kills the other guy with a rock with or a something. rock like yeah. then it's just Fascist like is. holy shit like that was like <laughs> the first like two pages before that you're just like oh yeah this is just a comic with cute characters and you're like oh no this is this is something else this is definitely something else um and uh that is like immediately hooked me like that um with that w- once i once i realized it once i got it i was like oh this is this is something special for sure so if the first issue was an experiment then that kind of answered my other question because you do create through all six stories you create this kind of like little universe uh of your characters in the town of elwich which i assume is a fictional town it is it's not Um, a real place is it based on any is it based on where you grew up or anything it is yeah it's inspired by i mean it's very southern ontario and for anyone that's did the uh, shop give it away or what's that i said did the crokinoles uh shop give it away (laughs) (laughs) one of my favorite games there's that for sure that's that's a good catch um but yeah, basically places I've lived in or or known people in have relatives live in. So basically the kind of towns that I've that I've lived in my my entire life. Yeah. And um specifically downtown Guelph as the template, but um Guelph is now too big to be a place like Elwich. Sure. Um sure. but it still holds on to some of those very strange ghost stories and and you know like there for example, here's a here's a true story is that um, just about a block away from me is a street called Baker Street. Um, they're currently, uh, they, they, they dug up an old parking lot, like a ground level parking lot that's been there for years, this empty mm-hmm. lot to build uh, density. They're gonna put the new library there. Now, the reason that had been just a flat parking lot for years is it, it, it's behind two churches and it used to be the churchyard. Oh man. And when they relocated the bodies to the main modern graveyard decades ago, um, I guess some didn't have headstones, so they missed some. And so Yikes. as they started their dig, they had to shut down the site because there were dozens and dozens of human remains. It was like the swimming pool and poltergeist over there. So, and this wow. is like a block away from me. So this is the kind of stuff that makes me go, hmm, interesting. What a weird town. Yeah. Fair enough. Wow. <laughs> Yikes. Um, yeah, because it does seem like um, there's something about the way, not only the stories themselves, but it something about the way that you tell them. A lot of them are like kind of slow burn uh, buildups to like a giant ending. But something about the way you write the characters, the way they interact, and the way that they're you know, like um, uh, Ham, the journalist, shows up in a few different stories. Like it just really seems, it really seems like natural and stuff. Like once, once you decided, once you knew you were going to make more, and mm-hmm. once, um, uh, like once you knew they were all going to take place in the same town, did you would you kind of like map out, like your like okay, well, this person's going to appear in this story. They die in this story, but they're going to show up later. Like, was there like a? Or was it just kind of something that happened as it went along, or uh, was that like it, a? a it was a little bit thought? planned, but yeah. mostly organic. Yeah, so mm-hmm. it, a little bit of both. So as I was, I mean, so all of these stories started as story ideas. So um, concept, character based first, if that makes sense. So sure. Yeah. And again, I am. Um, I like all horror cinema and and um i read a lot of horror as well but i've always been most attracted to the psychological horror um or um horror films that build slowly and may or may not be supernatural but might be in somebody's head you know baba duke's a great example of a film that works both ways um just as a quick so i'm really into art house horror and so these ideas um i would start with the idea and then as i was fleshing out the script i was (laughs) i was introducing too many new characters and i went well i don't need to 
I've already got these great characters. And it doesn't right. matter if I killed them off because maybe this happened uh, six yeah. weeks before. Right. Um, so that's how that started to, to more connect. And same with the locations is even though I don't have a full map of what Elwich looks like, if I've drawn a street um, in one story, I remember that that street's there. And so later on, if a character is stumbling home, bleeding from a bullet wound, I can walk her past the same location. Yeah, um, sure. And it makes sense to me that she's moving from north of the town to downtown. Yeah. Yeah. It's like enough of connectivity and familiarity that uh, makes it interesting and like sucks you in more. But it's not so like you said, there's not like a map or anything. It's not like you need to know all these details in order to get it. Like, it's not that kind of thing. It's like you couldn't you could just pick up issue two and read it. It doesn't matter if you don't recognize the journalist from issue one or the cop or whatever, you know, like it doesn't matter. Exactly. Um, but if you do, it's just, it's just this really kind of special, unique feeling. I don't know. I loved it. It was so cool. Well, thank you. That was the hope. The, the hope yeah. was to make them standalone lone stories, but as a, as a collected whole, it would have this, I mean, the, the Elwich itself is a, is a major character in the story. Yeah. And the, sure. and the yeah. only character that's in all of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's got that kind of vibe. I'm trying to think of, um, uh there's just horror movies where uh the town like is a part like Haddonfield or something is like a big part of like the absolutely Halloween or, or dairy or like dairy main sure yep. yes yeah yep yeah yeah i love stuff like that i i love that you could um i mean eventually you you you, you might exhaust i mean i don't, I don't want it to be a sunnydale hellhole kind of thing but yeah. uh you know <laughs> as i as i said we've got skeletons up the street so I mean, every town this size still harbors a lot of creepy secrets. Yeah, for sure. Um, what's your favorite horror movie? Uh, well, <laughs> that's a very complicated question. I know. Um, because <laughs> uh, it, it changes. And sure. um, but generally speaking, um, I usually go Exorcist. Um, I yeah. keep coming back to it, but it's but right up there. I mean, I, and because I like psychological horror, but even though it's technically a quote unquote slasher Halloween is an, is another yeah. big favorite um just because it's 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 just so brilliantly the tension's so, so good. great in that. so good yeah. um you know I I'm one of those people that likes the shining I know that's a that's a debatable one but I love it um but yeah I'd go exorcist if I had to if I forced to choose yeah I just rewatched the exorcist uh this year I hadn't seen it in a long time and it definitely still holds up do you think it's you think you go to the exorcist because you mentioned you mentioned that you probably saw it when you were too young to see it. Do you think that is part of the reason why it's? There's definitely some this nostalgia involved. Yeah, sure. yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that's the yeah. thing too is we could play. What's your favorite um, Western horror? Um, that probably be ravenous. Or what's your favorite horror movie of the last ten years? Like you know, th there there are different favorites, but yeah, the one that makes th that my happy place, <laughs> it's The Exorcist. If that makes sense. No, it does make sense because I have the same, my, I usually answer, if someone asks me that question, I usually either say Halloween or Alien. And Ooh, those yeah. are, those are two movies that I saw probably when I was too young to see them. Um, but I also both, I bought, I bought, I chose to watch both of them by myself, um, unsupervised. <laughs> so it's kind of <laughs> doing it to myself, Digger but those are the two that are still like in my soul in a way that I can't really describe. I'm just like, well, sh sure. And I mean, if you're counting it as a horror, as I do, I think most people do is Jaws is also another big oh. one that, I, that I've watched far too many yeah. times. Jaws is my favorite movie. Yeah. So good. Period. Literally so, his it, favorite I, movie of all yeah. time. Yeah. So, um, so, uh, speaking of that, I was going to add, was... no, no sharks in Elwich. So I can't yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. do any homage. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fine. Um, uh, just because I mentioned Alien, this is something I was maybe going to ask you later. You have written, uh, you, you you mostly do like creator owned stuff, but you have uh, dabbled in some like big IP properties. You've written Star Wars and Alien and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, the Alien specifically, I tried to find because I love Alien so much and I knew you were a horror person. I could not mm -hmm. find a copy of that without spending like over a hundred dollars on like some omnibus that it's in. Can you tell me what your alien story was about? Sure. It's called alien Wraith, And uh, I, it's probably, it's not because I wrote it that it's hard to find it. I think it's Eduardo Rizzo's first American work. Oh, wow. I think it's wow. his first story. Um, and I know at the time he couldn't read the, 
the English scripts we had to translate. And I did oh. thumbnails for him too, to make it easier for him to understand what I, what I was saying. Wow. I love that guy's art. Um, and uh, so, yeah, the idea is <laughs> basically that, um, again, the psychological horror component of the first film. Sure. That it is, um, plug your ears, kids, that there's this kind of rape horror built into it yeah. that, with the sure. Giger design of the alien's head too, the thing coming out of it and the yep. impregnation of the, so there's this, there's this rape horror um psychology built into this terror yeah the whole that, movie i feel like is an allegory for rape basically so and... so mine wraith is about um a closed research station that has a um has a male trapped inside so these kids break in to, to fool around and th there's a male trapped inside um who's really old um hasn't died and has turned pale in the darkness so it's white it's a white alien and there's no queen, so it can't reproduce. So it keeps it oh, keeps wow. attacking them and webbing them up, but it can't can't have... do anything. So it's like a dirty old man alien. Yeah, <laughs> it's gross. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, that's awesome, though. That's something I've never thought of in that world before. That's really cool. Um, so is this the end of Dwellings? Is there any chance for any more uh, stories in this uh, universe this, for this it, title? It's not the end of Dwellings. Yes. And. Uh, there should be announcement coming out pretty soon but oh, yeah all right. there will be more um i will say though don't get um everybody listening don't get too excited because dwellings takes a while and 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 what sure. i mean by that is the art style is very simple and i love drawing it and that's it's again that's my zone um that art style but the scripts because i'm trying to because i'm a horror fan and i'm trying to do something a little different yeah um the scripts take time so sure. it it might it might be a while, but there there are going to be more. That is great news, and uh, at least I know Steve and I will be there uh, when there is more for sure. Uh, but speaking of more, you are getting ready to launch um, a new book that is not a horror book uh, called Figgy. Furthermore, the Spirit <laughs> yeah. Guide Dog. Um, what's uh, tell us about uh, tell us about Figgy? Furthermore, well, getting back again, looping right back to the Hanna-Barbera meets Casper the Friendly Ghost vibe. Mm -hmm. um, so the the reborn gold key comics and I have been in, in talks for, I, I think a couple of years now, actually, oh, since wow. they first they were first dusting off the trademark and coming back and trying to rebuild this brand that was um, back in the day primarily known for non-superhero work. Mm -hmm. Back when there was a healthier mainstream. I'd say we have a healthy mainstream now. If it, I mean, if mainstream even means anything in comics right. anymore. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, Golki was mostly known for their licensed stuff. They did the first Star Trek comics, you know, the Lost in Space stuff. Um, everyone knows they're kind of more superhero adjacent stuff. And that's been parceled out over the years. But they were also a hugely successful publisher of kids comics. Um, they had the Disney license and the Hanna-Barbera license um, and the Warner Brothers license for decades. And I definitely grew up reading that stuff and have a particular fondness for the early 60s Hanna-Barbera comics. They did the, you know, the, the um, Adam Ant one shot, Frankenstein Jr. Yeah, um, sure. All that stuff is, is just some of my favorite comics. They're beautiful looking. Mm -hmm. um, they're goofy. And so Gold Key approached me because of my art style to see if I would like to do an all new, a brand new old school gold key comic. Sure. So uh, something that looked and felt like those old uh, 60s comics that I love, but that was updated and that was, nice. you know, a, a newer take. And of course I said, yes. Yeah. So the Kickstarter launches early February. I think it's February 6th, but the page is already up. You can, you can jump on there and and um, sign up for the alerts so you get all the details. But way do you see what these guys are doing? Um, Gold Key is so fun to work with. And we've got all kinds of cool variant guest artists for covers and some really neat um, uh, stretch goals and, and merch and stuff. So I'm pretty excited about it. It's a nice it's a nice palette cleanser from the horror. Sure. And, yeah. and the dog is still a ghost. So the there you go. So you the still basic got, I, we still yeah. got it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's so funny yeah, the basic premise is that he's a recently deceased family dog, and the young boy he's left behind is such a terrifyingly dangerous brat 
that he has to stick <laughs> around as a ghost to keep taking care of, of his boy. Safe. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's a really great, uh, that's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like, it's um, funny Steve and I on this I, podcast a lot, Steve and I are both, that, like, sorry, am I, am I saying the same thing that you're saying? I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, like, you can go ahead. For, yeah, since we started, uh, this was a COVID project for us too. So we were like, oh, that's oh so crazy. we yeah. need an outlet to do something. And this was our outlet. Uh, lo and behold two plus years we're still talking to each other every sunday night but um <laughs> we're both dads and for the the entirety of this podcast we've talked about like at this point my son won't put down like teen titans go like little graphic novel or whatever he just read through the whole damn thing last night but hey torres <laughs> yeah they, yes. a friend of mine yeah there you go. <laughs> great he uh but like for all the misconception that like comics are for kids there's not a ton of books out there that are like catered toward that younger demographic. Probably there's plenty for teens. There's plenty that have sure. aged up with childs of the nineties, like Mike and I that are now catering to us as adults, but there's not a whole ton for like that. Like I have a six year old, he has a seven year old, like that demographic of the kids learning to read and getting into stuff. And it's, it's like a dearth of inf like, yeah. Any, any thoughts on why that is or, why they're not creating to hook that next generation. I'm not sure. I, I see. I do see. I'm lucky is that my local comic shop here in Guelph is the dragon. And Jen has always been really good at when you walk in the store, the yep. first racks you see are low racks for kids and it has all, lots of kid friendly material on it. That's awesome. So I'm spoiled. I'm spoiled around here. Um, but it is interesting to me that most of the uh, con new comic books marketed to, to kids are licensed. Yeah. That's the first thing. Yeah. So again, we're still, you know, you 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 have to count on a, a television property, I think, to make or a toy or a toy to make these things work. Right. Right. So that's kind of that's kind of, I mean, that's great. It's unfortunate. And of the new stuff made for kids, this is going to sound highly critical, but um, it's just a fact. Most of them have a kind of sameness. Um, I've worked for kids magazines in the past too. And over the last decade, I've seen kids comics go from this kind of frontier land of, of wild fun and abandoned to, you have to have like a early childhood education degree to, to write a kid's comic. <laughs> and these things have gotten kind of unambitious, yeah. uh, and, and kind of unexciting. Um, Figgy is not that Figgy is, you know kind of out there it's a, it's a yeah. little outrageous Perfect. i mean i'm just working on issue two now and he's uh yeah where is that right there there's a couple pages already on the wall oh, cool. you can't see too much but um he's uh he gets hyped on his cousin's energy drink and he's running around on hydro wires you can't do that <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah you're not allowed to write that in a comic, yep. but there's nothing adult in it it's just ridiculous yeah yeah so i'm i'm hoping i you know Basically, my my hero for kids comics these days is Dave Pilkey, like the Captain oh, Underpants. Yeah, yeah. That, like that's the stuff. That's what this yep. stuff should be like. Yeah, uh, yeah. My son loves all the Dogman stuff, and we're yeah. reading the Cat Kid Comic Club stuff now. He got that for Christmas, and um, yeah, Dave Pilkey's crushing it. We're also going through old Calvin and Hobbes stuff. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Also, that's... he's loving that, and you know, and we do get like you know, DC does specific you know, like little kid Superman graphic novels and stuff like that, but um that's yeah like you're saying i'd like to see more and like there there is a sameness uh to some stuff but but i think what you said about uh figgy is accurate and just i'm like imagining like if you went into like disney and you were like i got an idea for a comic it's about a dead dog right <laughs> you're like what are you crazy Who, no who's the, who's the protagonist <laughs> well this kid lost his dog and it's yeah. the dog's <laughs> yeah. ghost what <laughs> so yeah first scene How's yeah. he going through his dad's toolbox? And he's sawing through the floor and hammering things into the wall. Kids can't use hammers. Yeah. No, 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 no. Like, a, yeah, no, no. <laughs> Figgy, Figgy can only exist as this zany comic book. So, yeah, um, yeah. I hope people check it out because I'm, I'm sure having a lot of fun. It's a nice palate cleanser between bouts of dwellings. <laughs> I, I think, I think I needed a, a little break from the horror. Yeah, I, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. Um, is a uh besides um or sorry how many issues of figgy furthermore uh can we expect is there gonna like a an arc or is it is it a single so, issue book or is it a 
collection? No, the first the first uh, series is six six issues. Oh, great. Um, and uh, Gold Key's plan is to kind of launch the campaign for all six all kind of at once. Uh, but again, stay po- uh, keep keep yourselves posted. Get onto the Gold Key um, Instagram or or their website to and and get to the Kickstarter because. There's going to be a ton of announcements, and once that starts, it's going to be fast and furious. Um, nice, very fun. And then um, it is again almost like we were saying about dwellings. They're all standalone, and and like those vintage um, uh, Hanna Barbera Gold Key comics, there are short stories within it. So there's two figgy oh, stories, and then there's backup stories too. So I have a four pager in every issue called Wax and Wayne, the Outer Sprites, and there are these two, like. Uh, outer space pixies oh, from nice. Jupiter's moons who have come to Earth in medieval times to um, capture a, 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 an earthling baby for their zoo. So there's that story. Uh, <laughs> That's it's ongoing. Awesome. Ridiculous. <laughs> and then there's oh, a backup feature called Kitchy and the Witchcrafts about a little girl who's staying at her grandmother's who's, who is a witch and has a basket of magic and she makes crafts out of them that then come alive and cause wow. havoc that's at the amazing. cottage and and how to make the craft is the back page so oh, that's great. all kinds of old school fun so if, i just feel like didn't... all of your ideas are so simple but i never would have thought of them in a million years but there's like they're so perfectly simple like like a yeah. hannah Barbera cartoon like you're saying like it's just like yep great concept that's it like you can describe it in one sentence that's it and it's great oh and now, <laughs> for some reason the the sidetrack there made me about like the other bits and pieces if anyone is listening to this and hasn't read dwellings oh yeah the the book itself is great the a plus plus is the little ads interjected in between and the back pages and everything that you think are like you know in a normal marvel or dc book you're looking through there's advertisements for all these other books there's advertisements for whatever in a classic book there'd be like advertisements to go mail order this thing like go get your uh Paul Revere Halloween, Halloween Bronco, masks whatever, or whatever yeah, yeah, Halloween yeah. masks or and <laughs> Jay has interjected all these little extra extra tidbits that are just absolutely impeccable. Yeah, perfect. I, I described <laughs> it to someone like as saying it's besides like it says Oni Press on the cover, but other than that, it's like this 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 is a book that exists in an alternate reality right. other than your own that you just right. if it wasn't found. for that little right. stamp, everything yeah. else in there is just completely created. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. That's awesome. The the ads are actually the most fun to me. That's awesome. I bet. And yeah. and again with the with the original Black Eye um, books run, so the original version, the single issue dwellings, that was part of that idea for the first one. And then we kept it up. Was that what if you were at an antique mar- mall or an antique market, and you were and you, there was one stall with with uh, long boxes of old comics, and you went through. And you found this old Harvey comic that you'd never seen before. You're like, mm. oh, this is good. You got, and then you opened it up, and it was adult horror, horrifying, yeah. Right. So we designed it to look and feel aged and look like a, a, yeah. a flea yeah. market find. Um, yeah. So like, <laughs> yeah, so like great. that's the yeah. back Perfect. of the. Oni and then one. and then when um, Oni delightfully um, asked if we if they could uh, um, partner with me again, it's a nice return. The last. Um, Direct market comic book I did was was Jack Hat Clubhouse with Oni oh, yeah. back in the day. So this is kind of a nostalgic return home too with Oni. Um, but when they were like, "Yeah, we'd love to introduce it to the to the direct market to a wider audience," and they pitched the idea originally of doing a two in one, and I went, "How great is that?" Because Harvey used to do these jumbo double size giant yeah. size issues, oh, right. and when we started talking about the format and they suggested prestige format, I said, "Well." Yeah, that works perfectly because it's almost as if you guys found these old comics and are now doing a reprint right. edition. Yep. You yeah. know, so the whole thing has just worked at every level. That's awesome. Yeah, it is perfect. It is perfect. Um uh I think we're getting close to our uh time limit here, but um outside of Figgy furthermore, do you have and, and eventually another round of dwellings, do you have anything other projects on the horizon or any Con appearances or anything that uh, you want to hype up or plug? 
Uh, the only appearance I know for sure that I have, but there might be some more announcements later, is um, TCAF, the Toronto Comics Rise Festival. I'll be there okay. this year. Um, as for other projects, I do have something in the works, uh, a, a four-issue scripted series with Dynamite, actually, oh. with a licensed pro uh, project, but there's some issue with the, the license. that We'll see. But anyway, that's coming. Oh, okay. And I will just say to, to listeners here, you know, it's mid-January. Um, Keep your eyes and ears on Oni Press next month because there's some, in addition to dwellings, there'll be oh. some big announcements. Oh, wow. Okay. Very good nice. to know. Um, just mentioning license properties, one more uh, question for you. Is there a character uh, from any licensed property that you haven't, that you loved or love that you haven't written that you would love to? That's a really good question. Um, I spent I mean, many, many years thinking about stuff like that, but yeah. no, I've, I've, I've almost done everything. I, yeah, I, I'd still, okay. I'm just, I'm a huge, um, 60s era doom patrol fan. And if I could, if I could write a doom patrol comic and especially with how surreal and bizarre that book has gotten over the years, yep. um, if somebody offered me that, that'd be very hard to turn down. Dude. I did. I, it would I don't know that I would have thought of that, but you saying that makes me want a Jay Stevens Doom Patrol book <laughs> hard, like more than anything. You would be a perfect writer for that book. Perfect. Writer. Maybe one day. I'll even take it in the the Harvey Comics style. <laughs> that would be great too. Oh sure, that'd, that'd be, be that'd be weird. Oh, that'd be, <laughs> that'd be so weird. That'd be great. Right up that alley. Um, all right. Well, Jay incredible talking to you um uh, wonderful to meet you again we're really big fans if you couldn't tell by all the compliments we threw at you during this uh, <laughs> thank you so much here. thanks for having me on and um, oh yeah and i should have mentioned too that the the hardcover dwellings collection is coming out in april so it's was, not too oh, far away i was gonna ask perfect oh so there will be a full collected edition of all six. yeah it's 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 just been announced and i think it's already up on amazon even for pre-order like it's oh it's it's great. Oh, i sweet. can't believe it's happening Wow, oh, that's wonderful. That's really great news. We yeah, will make sure to our... put the link to the Kickstarter notification in the show notes to this podcast uh, so people can check it out. Um, I'm already signed up to notify it. I'm definitely going to be uh, a subscriber, a day one um, backer of that uh, thinking furthermore. So um, again, Jay, thank you so much for being on the show and we'd love to have you back sometime. Awesome. My pleasure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Invite me back. I'll be here. All right. Sounds good. Sounds like a plan. Sounds good. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs> All right. Okay. Bye.